Okay, Marcus Williams. I'm an uh, illustrator, aka Marcus the Visual Online and stuff. So I just think it's super dope. It looks like other people think it's dope too. They've been checking out the Afrofuturism book and my Rayla series. My name is Afua Richardson. <laughs> I am a comic book illustrator, and you might know some of my work from Black Panther World of Wakanda, X Men 92, All Star Batman. My Adidas ND, close as can be. We make a mean team, my Adidas and me. We get around together, put down forever, and we won't be had when worn in bad weather. I spoke those words, and that's why rappers can get sick of them. ourselves into characters that may not look like us. And I think it's a profound thing to ask the rest of America to do that um, onto black characters and to say, how do you look at this person and say, this is, this is what a hero looks like, right? I think that that means a lot. Right on, right on. Hey. Hey. <laughs> so my apologies, I had to go to Wakanda and back. <laughs> Ryan, the detour through Zoom. Thanks for putting up with my silliness. Uh, Afua, uh, we've just been talking um, just basically about uh, all great things that pop culture and hip hop and wonderful things. But basically, the last question that was asked was how, uh, that Afrofuturism is such a big, you know, work, right? It doesn't have any boundaries. So basically, you know, how do you leave your mark on such a, a, you know, a lasting, massive kind of mindset, I guess? How do I leave my mark? Um, I want to share my story through my lines and my colors and for people to look at my work and to feel it the way that I did when I was facing really, really terrible times and observing really beautiful pieces of music and art that gave me hope in a way that was like, you know what, I know I've got all this crazy stuff going on in my life, but there's beauty somewhere, and it is right here, and I want to make this. And so I started playing flute when I was nine years old, and I played every single day, six hours a day, if that would be possible. And I felt like I could express myself through this more than I could vocal. I was very shy, I was really tall and lanky. <laughs> you know, I was a nerd and I loved comics and, and I decided, well, you know, music saved my life because I don't know who I would be without it. These comics, like I'm reading heavy metal and I'm being transported to other worlds. Afrofuturism is just seeing yourself in the future in another life. You know, like, seeing the possibility of things for yourself, and not just projected upon whatever icon is given to you, but making that projection, being the author of your own story. So I wanted to become the author of my own story that enabled me to give the psychological permission to someone else to say, I am great, I'm a freaking wizard, I'm a warrior, <laughs> I am whatever it is that I decide to be, because I see how it affects people's lives. Like, I was on the track team because of Chitara from the Thundercats. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and my, my older sister and I, we would watch Star Trek. She just got her PhD from John Hopkins and did the Wakanda salute during her graduation. <laughs> she's a real life shirt. You know, it just, art allows you to create a template for the future. So being able to paint or provide a mirror that says, you are also great. I love me. That was long. Tashi, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to finish that up? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I 
wrote the book Afrofuturism? why haven't I heard this term before? And I went to Clark Atlanta University, and woo woo, and you see, C-A-U. Um, I went to Clark Atlanta University, and so many of the students in the campus were totally into thinking about futures, and mysticism, and comic books, and how you create social change, and they're analyzing hip hop lyrics, and they're just trying to create new worlds and new futures, and they felt like art was important, and they felt like the contributions that people of the African continent and of the diaspora had made to technology was not being acknowledged. They wanted to research, they were studying these things, they wanted to bring it to the forefront, and they wanted to articulate a new future. That was our pastime in college. That was just what we were doing and talking about because we believed in it but we weren't always using the term Afrofuturism. And in retrospect, I remember reading Mark Derry's essay, um, and, but the term didn't stick. So years later, after I had done a lot of work writing about culture and hip hop, and I knew a lot of artists who were really into Afrofuturism, not calling it Afrofuturism, I hear this term, and a friend of mine was telling me she was teaching it in college, and I'm thinking, Okay, why haven't I heard this term if I've been in the culture writing about this? And I was frustrated. So I said, well, let me research it. And then I didn't see enough accessible works on it. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book and talk about all these contributions that people have made to the theory, how people have produced from music and art and history and all kinds of ways. Because to me, it was important to value the imagination and to value how the imagination has been a resilience tool and has transformed lives for people around the world. And most importantly, so that people didn't feel alone. Because I knew people who were into these kinds of works and then after college, they didn't know what to do with it. They weren't necessarily artists. They didn't know you could write Afrofuturism theory. So what do you do with it? You stay a fan. You look for people to create works. You talk to a friend or two who may be able to share in those theories. And I said, you know, I want to write a book that I would have read in college, that my friends would have read in college, and they could have felt, wow, I'm not alone. Uh, I can build on these ideas instead of thinking the same ideas over and over again and being afraid to articulate it because they don't feel supported and they don't know how to build. And it's like, well, history is over here and science is over there and you can't merge it. No, Afrofuturism says you can. And that there's natural relationships between these things. So for me, it was about helping to empower people to see themselves. Um, when I first started talking about Afrofuturism, sometimes I would meet people and they would show me a drawing that was completely futuristic, but it pulled from ancient themes and they would say, is this okay? I'm like, what do you mean is this okay? Is this okay? Like, would anybody like this? And then they would say, well, would anybody buy this? And it's like, well, you're not going to create it and share it unless you know it's going to be accepted? You know, I would, when I first started working with my Rayla character, my time traveling character, and I wanted to talk, I wanted to write about someone who wasn't limited by the frameworks of today, but still could be infused by culture and still could be a black woman, but black isn't defined in the future as it is today because you're on another planet 200 years into the future. And, but when I started talking to certain artists, they would give me an image of a woman that was not a black woman. And I would say, okay, well let me, maybe I'm not describing this one. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would give another, you know, a description. And, and each time, and at some point, I had to say, okay, what's going on? And I realized, subconsciously, or consciously, they're creating an image that cannot be easily interpreted as a woman of African descent, because they don't know if it can be accepted. And it's like, I mean, I've talked to people who write sci-fi, and they say, oh, my first sci-fi story is I never use black characters, although I'm black, because 
I didn't know that was okay. And it's like, wow, you can't imagine yourself into the future because you're looking at someone else's imagination of who you're supposed to be. And you've accepted that. And you've taken on somebody else's mythology or stereotype as your own, and then you're projecting what they say you are. Instead of pulling within and, and looking at your own sense of understanding to recreate your own image. I'm just talking about image. I'm not even talking about what it symbolizes <laughs> or the cultural frameworks that it references. People say representation and they think that just means brown faces. No, we're talking about perspectives and histories and things that come out of being in urban communities and rural communities or being in West Africa or South Africa, or being in Cuba, being an Afro-Latino. We're talking about all of these things and how those cultures have shaped and have relationships with the future and they build on it. And so it's an image, but it's what the stories that come with the image. All we're talking about is can I tell a story that I imagine, that I know someone else would like to read? Can I do that? That's all Afrofuturism is at some point. Can I do what humans do and see myself beyond where I am right now? Can I look at a superhero and look at that as a point of inspiration? Nobody says I want to fly to another galaxy necessarily, although I was in places where people are working on that. But they're like, can I think about it without feeling like something's wrong? So this is about people not looking for permission to tell their own story, not looking for permission to be able to say I'm in the future. And to say that at the end of the day, we're all human beings, we all contribute, and we want to share from the lessons and stories so that we don't repeat the isms of the past. So that's why I wrote that. <laughs> well, and that's a great segue to actually open the floor for questions. Um, so feel free, you have this wonderful minds. Think about the kids who are coming up now, where DMC and Ironheart exist already. You can, as long as you maintain a, a truth within your work and you keep your work on par, and you, you do whatever you can to support it. You, you create community around it, you, you share it with people as best you can, because with, you know going up against a titan like Marvel, they have a lot of resources, but the internet provides an even playing ground. So if you're providing something of service, there's something missing, think of yourself as a speedboat, and uh, Marvel is more of a giant tanker. Yeah. So they can go across <laughs> larger uh, audiences, but they can't maneuver in the minutia of stories that, you know, there's a need. There's a need for a niche story, and you can provide that. You know, so create your community, support others. You have to find a way to support your work and give people what they can use through your work. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Can I say two quick things about that? Sorry. Two quick things about that. I would love to see more work from independent creators and all over that like continues to push into spaces of like black emotion and interiority. So as you know, there are a lot of people that read graphic novels that, that don't read superhero stuff and they read graphic novels that are more like Persepolis type, right? Like that's really about people's interior lives, blankets, you know, Chris Ware, that kind of work. And I think that there's still a lot of space um, and kind of uncharted space for black people who are already doing that work to be uplifted and for folks that haven't moved into that space, to, we don't need permission to write that kind of work, right? And I also want to say one other thing, like even within the Marvel and DC construct, when I found out that I was writing Ironheart and it wasn't public yet, do you know how salty it made me hmm. that um, people were constantly like, when Black Panther the film came out, people were like, well, Shuri should be Ironheart. And the reason I got on my nerves is because the idea is that there can be only one, right? And now, oh, now we found the Black girl. And now the black girl will be all of them, it will be everything, right? And it's kind of like the, when people discover Chadwick Boseman and then Chadwick Boseman was third good Marshall. Chadwick Boseman was, you know, Chadwick Boseman was Prince coming this fall. And it's like, whoa, very talented, amazing, there's no shame. Please do not tell Chadwick Boseman anything like that. It's not a shame. But there's this thing of like, don't anoint a, a 
anointing individuals is another way of keeping everybody else out, right? And like, beyond Wakanda to me also means like, yeah, you should be a black girl superhero who's not royalty, right? And who doesn't have, like, who is kind of broke actually most of the time, right? And you know, and like, it's kind of doesn't really have friends and it's not that cool, right? And like, all of us want to continue. We need more black trans characters, black disabled characters, black homeless characters, black undocumented characters. And, and that has to come from independent, that has to come from everywhere, so. Let's not discount her, but Shuri is probably my favorite quote unquote Disney princess. Because <laughs> you, you have the Killmonger was right shirt? Yep. I need a shot. All right, so my question is um, more general but specific in the hip hop realm. Um, you were speaking earlier about the New Zealand dance that is um, kind of shared amongst that entire culture. Um, how do you feel and how do you? Use, um, would draw that blurred line between um, cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation, um, specifically in the hip hop realm, where when the first hip hop song to play on MTV was Walk This Way. Walk This Way isn't the first rock rap hip hop record to be on MTV. The first rap rock hip hop record to be on MTV was a record called Rock Box, 1984. Boy, it is. Walk this way gets their shine, like you said, because we had you know white Aerosmith dudes with us. But we did get on MTV. We was doing it. See, Rock Box was brilliant because it was just me and Run rapping over rock songs. So when MTV, you know, they, they wasn't going to play, um, they wasn't going to play Planet Rock. No. They wasn't going to play, um, Treacherous Three, Yes We Can, Can. You know, evil destruction, tax deduction, price inflation, rocks the nation, and unemployment is on the rise. It's hard to find a compromise, but if it lasts like this for a long enough time, only to nothing but a higher level of crime. And that's what those, that's what the Treasure Street really was doing. They wasn't just hippity hopping and hippity on. <laughs> so the white folks wasn't going to play that. They wasn't going to play Mo D going, once to know body from the neighborhood, took a hop to the top, because I knew that I would, and he see a future. Um, 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 I won't settle for less. I was one of the best. I don't consider it luck because I'm not blessed. I got my life all together. Love the way that I live. Go to school really cool and I think positive. And then he said it's all right to have fun, lots of pleasures and joy, but it's the brain that separates the men from the boys. So Mo wasn't coming to be on TV partying and black people having a good time. No, he was coming to break us, but he wasn't going to pray that. But that being said, the only reason why we got on MTV because we did incorporate the rock guitars and rock box. And they had Professor Erwin Corey, who I don't know if you'll see the movie Car Wash. He was the guy with the piss sample they thought was the bomb. Remember <laughs> that scene in Car Wash was a brilliant scene. So they had him, the white guy, Professor Erwin Corey, open Rock Box up on you know MTV channel. What is rock, rock music? Is and he just started blabbering some, you know, some some theory that he had, you know, off the top of his head. But once Rock Box got on him. We was like, okay, hip hop is in there. So we have a responsibility. We wasn't thinking of making Walk This Way and yo, let's sample a Beatles song so they can accept us. Oh, no, we wasn't thinking that. The reason why we did rock anyway, the first place anyway, because before, before Rappers of Light was even allowed to be reported, when you would come to the streets of New York City, we was rapping over rock songs. So like you said, it's never nothing new. Hey, ah, that's what I was going to tell you then, I was going to say. Then to come to find out, black people created this rock thing that the white guys is doing. But you got to understand how much power we have. It's always beyond Wakanda. It's always beyond the Bronx. It's always beyond MTV. It's always beyond Adidas, you know what I'm saying? But So when I grew up in Hollis, Queens, New York, I was a brother in the hood and went to Catholic school my whole life, geeky, nerdy kid that just read, collected, and drew comic books. 70s rock radio was a big influence on me, not just because it was, it was the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and Bob Dylan and they were white, 
there was something about the sound of the rock drums that reminded me of Africa. The shit was hard and the loud guitar. So in 1985, when we did our next video, everybody was asking me this. Why you didn't call yourselves the kings of rap? Because now hip hop is starting to buzz and everybody know that it's the black thing and you know, now the white people are paying attention and stuff like that and we getting radio play. My thing was, I don't want to be the king of rap. I'm going for Mick Jagger's jugular. I want Elvis to bow when I walk in the room. I want Bob Dylan to move out my way so I can step to the right and I can become the king of rap. Now that once we have established, 86 comes along, and then we decide to let the white people come play with us, and we did something that's great. Like you said, it's always about togetherness and moving on and setting it up. In the Walk This Way video, People from all races, creeds, religion, I'm talking about Muslims and Jewish people, or Israel people, Asian people all over the globe say this to me running Jay. Jay, rest in peace when Jay was alive. You know in the Walk This Way video, when Steven Tyler took that mic and knocked down that wall that was separating you in the video? They said, oh, that shit didn't just happen in the video. That happened in the world. So we gave birth to, by you standing up and, 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 and taking responsibility for your position, not by what you're going to get commercially and the money you get, but you know that you're doing something. Buster Ron said, motherfucker, run to your seat and just change music. They change fashion. They change the way white people and black people get along. They change sciences. They change everything. So just one little step. I would just say, too, that when it comes to this cultural appropriation, it's more about not acting as if taking on this, this persona of I'm the first person to really do something with this craft and this art form. Uh, and having some recognition, depending on what culture you're a part of, that there could be a perception that you have an advantage, or you might have a very real advantage in making a statement, and could be the first space or person associated uh, with that particular art form. And if so, to always acknowledge, hey, this is something that I do, but I'm not the first. There are many others, and this is, these are the ones who participate and to also work within the culture as well. Uh, I remember someone once, uh, and it was a, a white guy, and he was asking, he was telling me he wanted to do a black steam story. I said, okay. And he was talking about the research he was doing, you know, about culture in the 1800s. And I said, well, do you hang around black people today? <laughs> you know, and, and you hang around you, but to go into other kinds of spaces, whether it's churches or businesses or communities, and not to look at it as, you know, oh, I'm assisting these people who need help, but look at what it is they bring to the table. Use that kind of as a basis, so you have at least some framework for talking about black culture outside of, you know, just, exactly. So it's not, not looking at it like it's a study or you're a scientist, and, you're an observer, you know, and, and for some people, that takes a lot of work.